I think I just have to begin by saying once again how good it is to actually see you here. Um, you have no idea how difficult it is to preach to a camera. It just, it, it's not the same experience. And even though some of you are a long way out there, it's still better to have you here than not here. Well, last week um, we had kind of a, a rousing go get em sermon. We are not descended from fearful men, and that was on purpose. And uh, this morning, this is more of like a group hug, okay? This is more of a group hug this morning. What I want to talk about this morning is just the joy of being together. And David said it best in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. These certainly are unique times that we live in. Uh, it was already unique with COVID-19, and it's become even more strenuous and more unique in what's happened in the last couple of weeks. And yet I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's unprecedented. Unprecedented means it's never happened before. And that's not really the case. As someone who, who loves history, I know that these kinds of things have actually happened fairly frequently in the past. Most recently was just over 100 years ago. In 1918, as World War I was coming to a close, another enemy was slowly, painfully, methodically approaching the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., and that new enemy was the Spanish flu. By the spring of 1918, or between the spring of 1918 and the spring of 1919, the Spanish flu infected nearly a third of the world's population, claiming the lives of nearly 100 million individuals, making it one of the deadliest pandemics in all of human history. Between October of 1918 and February of 1919, an estimated 50,000 cases were reported in Washington, D.C. alone, claiming the lives of some 3,000 of her residents. As the number of cases exploded throughout the city, on October 4th, the city health officer, Dr. Fowler, asked area churches to please refrain from gathering in order to protect their congregations from the plague. Well, as these churches heard the news, they immediately called for emergency meetings with their leaders. And by and large, the churches of Washington, D.C. unanimously voted to comply with the government's request. Over the next few weeks, as the numbers began to decline, churches began to plead with the government to allow them to meet again. One Baptist minister, Pastor Waldron, wrote an editorial on October 29th. This is what he wrote. He said, the authorities are woefully lacking in reverence to God, and they are wanting in a correct knowledge of the character and mission of the church. When they place her in the same class with pool rooms, dance halls, moving picture places, and theaters. And I love this. The Christian church is not a luxury, but a necessity to the life and perpetuity of any nation. In modern terms, we are essential, is what he's saying. Well, the government finally relented, and on October 29th, they released the order banning churches. And all, to all told, the churches had consented to not meet for a total of four Sundays in the midst of the Spanish flu. Well, on the first Sunday that they were able to come back, November 3rd of 1918, the Reverend J. Francis Grimke preached a powerful sermon that was later published and distributed. The title of the sermon was Some Reflections Growing Out of the Recent Epidemic of Influenza That Afflicted Our City. And recently I was able to acquire a copy of that original sermon and to read through it. And in this sermon, Grimke reflected on the severity of the plague, which had just overwhelmed the hospitals of Washington, D.C. It had such a high mortality rate that it was difficult to find enough coffins to bury the dead, let alone to find enough men to dig the graves to bury the dead. But, but Grimke knew, just as all good pastors know, that it is deeply harmful it is inherently unhealthy for the church not to gather together. He wrote this. He said, I started to worry at first as it seemed to upset all of our plans for the fall work, but I soon recovered my composure. And I said to myself, why worry? God knows what he is doing. Out of it, I believe that great good is coming. 
all the churches, as well as the community at large, are going to be stronger and better for this season of distress through which we have passing. Those are good words. We need to hear those kinds of words right now. He then went on to say, I have been thinking, as doubtless you have all been, of these calamitous weeks through which we have been passing. Thinking of the the large numbers that have been sick, the large numbers that have died, the many homes that have been made desolate. And I have been asking myself the question, what is the meaning of it all? And then this is the part of the sermon that really got my attention. He said, the fact that for several weeks we have been shut out from the privileges of the sanctuary has brought home to us as never before what the church has really meant to us. We we hadn't thought, perhaps, very much of the privilege while it lasted. But the moment it was taken away, we saw at once how much it meant to us. Then he said this, There is no single influence in a community that counts more than the Christian church. It is a great mistake for anyone to stand aloof from the Christian church. Everyone in the community ought to have a church home and ought to be found in that church home Sabbath after Sabbath. I, I, I could not have said it any better myself. I want to invite you, turn your Bibles with me to the 122nd Psalm, Psalm 122. Those who have been with us online for these last few weeks, 10 weeks as a matter of fact, you know that we have been beginning our services by reading the Psalms of Ascent, these songs that Jewish pilgrims would sing, these songs that are full of longing as the pilgrims would make their way up to Jerusalem. And during these 10 weeks, I purposefully held back on reading Psalm 122 until this very Sunday, because this is a psalm about the joy of corporate worship, worshiping together. Let's read the text together. Psalm 122, a song of a sense of David. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. The thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, now, like I said, this is a song about the joy of corporate worship. It's a song about about the goodness and, and the rightness of the people of God gathering together to worship, to, to extol, and to praise Almighty God. Now, for David, that act of corporate worship happened at Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is mentioned so often in this psalm. But for us, that act of corporate worship happens every time we gather together as the church. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that you, the church, you are God's temple. That house of the Lord David refers to in Psalm 122. You now, as the people of God, you are the temple. And that God's spirit dwells in you. Now, I, I should also say this. In order for corporate worship to be corporate, it requires the physical presence of the entire church. That is the definition of corporate worship. It's everyone corporately gathering together physically and worshiping. You see, there's, there is something that is just absolutely unique. There is something that is mysteriously profound. There is something that is compellingly beautiful about the physical gathering of the church herself for the purpose of worship. And and try as we may, nothing can substitute for the physical gathering of the church. 
Now, I'm very thankful for our online ministries. They served us as a life support for these last 10 weeks, but make no mistake, the online presence of the church is not the same thing as the physical presence of the church. I told many people during this season that online services are kind of like kissing your bride through a veil. It, it's something, it's better than nothing, but it's not the same thing. You see, one of the distinctives of our God is that he is the God who gathers. Throughout the whole Bible, we are introduced to this God who continually, persistently gathers his scattered people together. And, and on the contrary, the opposite of that is that sin and Satan are what scatter and separate people from one another. God is the one who gathers. Sin is that which scatters us. And we have certainly seen that this week. As our nation has once again descended into the madness of injustice, racism, and race riots, all of the horrible things that have happened in the last few weeks, whether they be the death of George Floyd, the deaths of at least eight peace officers killed in the line of duty, or the devastating effects of domestic terrorism that have gripped so many of our major cities, the primary effects of these kinds of sin is to separate us, it's to divide us, it's, it's to scatter us. And that's what Satan loves to do. He is the one who scatters, but the God of the Bible is the God who gathers his people, who, who beckons his people to come together in peace, in unity, in love, and to bind their hearts ever tighter to his. Our God is the God who gathers. And so how just profoundly good it is, how exceedingly right it is that we are gathered together this morning in this place for the purpose of corporate worship. As, as David so beautifully articulated, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. This morning, I want to briefly look at three reasons why we are so glad to once again gather together at the house of the Lord. The first reason that we are so glad to gather together this morning is because we love the word of God. First reason we are glad together, gl glad to gather together this morning is because we love the word of God. One of the primary purposes of God in gathering his people together is to speak with them. Our God is, is the one who, who loves to speak, yea, verily, who, who cannot help but speak. That, that's why preaching is such a critical part of worship. Because we believe that, that through the act of preaching, God himself is addressing his gathered people. And I love how Murray Cappell put it in his book, The Heart is the Target. Cappell wrote, through the long history of the church, Nothing has won as many souls, changed as many lives, built up as many saints, and strengthened as many churches as the faithful preaching of God's word. And we also know that the only kind of preaching that God blesses is what we call expository preaching, preaching that finds its beginning, middle, and end in the Word of God. And the reason why expository preaching is the only kind of preaching that God blesses is because of God's supreme commitment to the integrity and, and the authority and the life-changing power of His own Word. David said it like this in Psalm chapter 19. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, 
rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And moreover, by them is your servant warned. In, in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 23, verse 29, the prophet said this, Is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Or in 1 Corinthians one twenty one, Paul said it like this, For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. You see, in, in the wisdom of God, he has appointed preaching, the preaching of his word, as the means by which he gathers his people, he, he comforts his people, instructs his people, and then sends his people out on mission. There is something that is uniquely powerful, something almost miraculous about a real man of God standing before the people of God with real blood coursing through his veins, with real oxygen filling his lungs, declaring the very thing thoughts of God to the people of God. In that man moment, that man's voice becomes the very voice of God himself as God's people gather together to hear God speak to their hearts. It's one of the reasons we spent so much time and effort working on live streaming our services rather than pre-recording them. Because we really do believe that there is something uniquely powerful about preaching that happens in the moment, which is different from preaching that you hear through a podcast or a pre-recorded video. There's a, a unique dynamic there that we think is important, that we think helps us to hear the very voice of God himself in that moment, in the act of preaching. And so the, the first reason that we are so glad to be together this morning is because we love the Word of God. And the second reason we're so glad to be together is because we just love one another. Don't miss the plural pronouns in Psalm 122, verse 1. David says, I was glad when they said to us, let us go to the house of the Lord. There is something indispensable about the they and the us here. Something indispensable, something that we, we really can't live without. That's why the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10 tells us, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. We need to be together. That's why this, the psalmist says in Psalm 133, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. That, that love that the church corporately has for one another, that love transcends whatever differences of opinion we might have about politics, preference, and pandemics. And I know that there is no end of opinions about politics, preferences, and pandemics at this moment. And one of the key passages that has guided our church through this season is Romans chapter 14, where Paul discusses debatable issues, things that Christians can have legitimate disagreements about. In Romans 14, he says, one person believes he may eat anything. That was the issue of the day. What can you eat because of Jewish kosher laws? One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Well, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Here's the key. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. In other words, there's room to disagree, and it's okay if we disagree. 
no doubt, as we go forward from here, there will be plenty of opportunities for us to disagree about politics, preferences, and pandemics. And that's okay. Because what makes it possible for us to disagree with one another graciously is our mutual love for one another. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 John 4, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. You know, throughout this season, our elders continued meeting in order to pray for our congregation, to strategize, and to try to find God's heart in the midst of this whole thing. I remember at one of the earliest meetings that we had, and we we were talking, we just started rehearsing all of the ways that you were taking care of one another. And just loving one another naturally, organically, calling each other, praying for each other, serving each other without any kind of administration. You guys just did it. And I told the men as we were talking about these things, I said, look, we we need to stop our meeting right now and just take a moment to thank God for giving us such a wonderful congregation to care for. You know, the author of Hebrews told his readers to obey their leaders in such a way that the ministry would be a joy for those leaders and not a burden. Well, beloved, on behalf of all of our elders, I want you to know that you have made our ministry, even ministry during this incredibly trying time, you have made our ministry such a joy. It is not a burden to shepherd this congregation. It is truly sheer, pure, unadulterated joy. And and that is because of how well this congregation loves one another. That's why we love to be together like we are this morning. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord, because I love the word of God. We love one another. We love the people of God. Finally, we are so glad to be together because we believe that God is worthy of our worship. Psalm 95 one says, Oh, come, let us sing to Yahweh. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Or Psalm 34.3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Psalm 150, the whole psalm, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord praise the Lord. And that's why Sunday after Sunday, we, we delight to gather together to do the same thing all over again, to sing, to worship, to exalt the name of Christ. Week in and week out, Christians just never get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again of worshiping. I don't know if you've heard the story before of Clive Waring. Clive had no idea that March 26th, 1985, would be his last day of conscious thought. It was the day when a virus cut a hole in Clive's brain, causing all of his memories to fall out, making it impossible for him to remember anything that happened before March 26th, 1985, or anything that happened after March 26th, 1985, other than than his beautiful wife. It's the only thing he remembered. For years, every time Clive would see his wife, if it was the first time that he'd seen him that day when she pulled in to the hospital and went to his room, or if she had just stepped out of the room for 30 seconds to talk to a nurse and just walked back in, every time he saw her for years, he would run up to her, pick her up, swing her around and say, I thought I was dead. If I had any thoughts at all, but I can see you. 
I'm seeing everything properly now. That's exactly how we feel every time we gather together to worship. Worship, specifically corporate worship, clears the fog away from our minds. It resets the compass of our hearts to true north and once again draws us into the presence of our true love, the Lord Jesus Christ. We love the word of God. We love the people of God. And we love the glory of God. And that's why it is so good. That's why we are so glad to be together once again. Allow me to close with a story. I encourage you, as as I tell you the story, to notice the critical role of the church here. You could almost miss it, but notice how critical the church is in this account. It's a story about a Romanian Christian woman named Virginia Pradin. She got saved under the brutal communist dictatorship of uh, Nikolai Kashkiu. Virginia spent years searching for the truth, but it always seemed like it was out of reach for her. One evening, a client came to discuss some paperwork with her. She was exhausted. She was discouraged. But she couldn't help but noticing that this particular client, who she'd been meeting with for months, seemed to radiate a certain kind of joy and a peace that were just totally foreign to her. And without even thinking about it, while the man was in her office, she said, I wish I had what you have in your life. I wish I had some sense of peace and happiness. And so the man, taking a terrible risk, said, Well, do you go to church? Would you like to come with me to my church this Sunday? It's an incredibly dangerous thing for him to do. It was a dangerous thing for her to consent to because it was illegal to go to church in Romania. Christians were regularly arrested, beaten, and imprisoned. Church buildings were bulldozed, and their land was confiscated by the Communist Party. But Virginia took the risk and went to church that Sunday. And the pastor read John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Virginia sat in that small, illegal church, spellbound by the truth of the Scripture. She would spent years, her whole life, searching for the truth. So when a pastor gave an invitation to come to Christ, she responded and became a Christian. She quickly became a target for the communists because of her legal background. One night, a man came to her law office, sat down in front of her desk, reached into his coat and pulled out a gun. He said, you have failed to heed the warnings that you've been given, but I have come here to finish the matter once and for all. I am going to kill you. Virginia stopped and prayed. And then she decided to just go ahead and share the gospel with him. So she looked him right in the eye and she said, have you ever asked yourself, why do I exist? Or why am I here? What's the meaning of my life? She leaned forward and said, you are here because God puts you here and he is putting you to a test. The truth is we've all been corrupted and we've gone away from God. We are all sinners and our sinner has determined our future. The Bible says people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. But the good news is that God has prepared a way out for every one of us through through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, the man sat there for a minute thinking. Finally, he brought his hand to his forehead and said, You're right. The people who sent me here are crazy. I need Christ. And he promised, I will come to your church. I will worship your powerful God. You see, when when God seeks out the lost, when God saves sinners... He gathers them into the church, into this beautiful community where he makes their hearts glad together. The hymn writer said it like this, I love your church, O Lord. Her saints before you stand, dear as the apple of your eye, engraven on your hand. Beyond my highest joy, I prize her heavenly ways. Her sweet communion, solemn vows, 
her hymns of love and praise. I love your church, O God, the people you have called, the church our blessed Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. Let's pray. Father, our heart just resonates with that song. We love your church, O God, and we are so glad to be together once again. Lord, just as those churches in Washington, D.C., a hundred years ago, took the time to thank you for delivering them and for bringing them back together, here too, a hundred years later, we also want to say thank you for bringing us back together. We love this church. Lord, we love your word. We love the people of this church, and we love to be together and to worship, for you are worthy of it. Father, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. It is all in your hands, and we trust you as we go forward from this place. God, help us to be faithful witnesses and to continue to love one another in the same way that Christ loved us. For we ask it in his name. Amen.